and good morning. Welcome to the Salvation Army. Welcome to worship. We thank you for joining us and uh, we're happy to be here. We're even happier that the heating is now working. Uh, <laughs> it's been rather cold for the last few weeks. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to not have a sermon. We're going to have four sermons. Uh, we, we're we're taking, making use of the uh, relaxed, uh, the restrictions being re uh, rolled back. And um, we've got uh, Kevin, Kelly, Roderick and Anita are going to share with us this morning. Um, a verse from Hebrews, chapter 13. You have to excuse me, I have to put my glasses on. Let us then always offer praise to God as our sacrifice through Jesus which is the offering presented by lips that confess him as Lord. When I was thinking about the songs for this Sunday, just the name of Jesus kept coming over and over into my mind. I have to take those off as well. Um, and I was talking to Karen about the songs I was going to use, and she said, oh, great. Because, and I'm like you, I'm sure, when she hears the name Jesus out in the community, it's not always a great way of hearing the name of Jesus. It's used as a swear word. But here we're going to sing about that beautiful name, that name above all names, that beautiful name of Jesus. And I invite you to stand where you are and join with us as we sing about this beautiful name. Jesus, name above all. 
But that wasn't the, st- the stop. That wasn't, that's where, not where it ended. That was the start. And in my devotions, I've been continuing on reading through Acts. And uh, just recently, I read the story where um, Peter and John were walking into the temple. And they saw the uh, lame beggar. And Peter said, I don't have any money for you. But in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. There's power in the name of Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, Jan played for the offering, and that song has just been stuck with me. So we're going to sing that. It's called the Spirit Song, the Spirit of Jesus coming to live in us. And I invite you to sing with us. Let the Son of God enfold you. Give him all your years 
days of pain and you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come. thank you for that powerful name that you have of Jesus that can take our sins away, that can forgive us, that can cleanse us, that can heal us, that can bring us joy and peace, that you can give us strength. Lord, we call upon that name right now and ask that your Holy Spirit would fill each one of us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning. And we are going to continue in a time of prayer just now. Starting last Sunday, Pentecost, the Salvation Army nationally has called us to 21 days of prayer, the Pray It Forward initiative. And this week, we start the theme of cutting back, letting go. Central to this time is the whole words of John 15, with Jesus as the vine dresser and the church needing to be grafted into the vine and the pruning that does need to happen, not just of the dead branches, but the pruning of the healthy so new life can flourish more and more. The points for prayer this week. Pray for a willingness to surrender to the pruning process. Pray that we would be willing to let go and be cut back in order to promote growth and to see more lives transformed with the love of Jesus. Be still. Pause and ask God to show the Salvation Army new ways to spread the good news in word and deed. And I love this one. Pray that we will be known as a praying army, our daily lives drenched in prayer. Pray for a mighty move of the Spirit across our army and our nation, giving us courage to be all he has raised us up to be. And pray for boldness to respond to what God is revealing to us as a movement. As I said, we're going to share those moments in prayer. There's an open invitation for those that are gathered here to lead us in prayer as well. There may be moments of silence. Just wherever we are, we pray together as we start this second week of our call to prayer. Let's turn our hearts and our minds to God. Lord Jesus, 
The pruning process in our lives is never easy. Cutting out those things that shouldn't be there, that you don't want to be there, Lord, that will cause us discomfort, that will cause us pain. But Lord, we know in the long run that it is good for us. It will produce new fruit. It will produce greater fruit. So Lord, I ask for myself, Lord, that you would take those parts of me that are not of you, that you want to change and improve and get rid of it completely. And Lord, that you would prune those things back, that you'd cut them out of my life, that you would uh, create in me that new growth, the new growth in you. Lord, I pray for the, the same thing for those people who are listening here in this hall that I'm in now, but also, Lord, those on the live stream. Lord, that they would be praying the same, that they would... Uh, Take comfort in your name. Take strength in your name to allow you to do the work in their lives as you are doing in my life right at this moment, Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, it is often said in these days that the past doesn't um, shape today. But we know, Lord, that personally in our lives that's not the case. There are many things in our past that we can dwell on and that will affect how we respond today in this world. But Heavenly Father, that is not what you want for us. For your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven... There needs to be a change. And that change in this world isn't just about our custody of the world. It isn't just about the reconciliation of people. It's about a change of attitude. That we put behind us the past. The same as you have wiped our sins away from your memory, Lord. We must wipe away the past the sins of others that have perhaps affected us, our own sin that we may just um, dwell in when we shouldn't. So, Father, we would ask that you would prune away the things of past that would shape our today and our tomorrow and that we would be exactly what you wanted us to be, born again, new and born of you, that we would have the view of Jesus in all things. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, it's often been said that the Salvation Army is an army with its sleeves rolled up to come alongside people and get on with that job of doing. But I pray, Lord, that that ethos and that ethic that we have, that everyone may understand that that work begins on our knees. May we be a praying army. May we be seeking you daily, earnestly, for what you have to say to us in these times, the way you wish to lead us forward, to be your people, to be the love of Jesus reflected out into the world. And Lord, we pray we may do that with boldness and with joy so we show and live out the great hope that spurs us on, the hope that comes from the resurrected life of Jesus and the eternal presence of you now dwelling with us. It is a mighty work you have called us to, Lord. But we know it's not in our own strength, but it is by the strength of your spirit that we do it. So drench us, drench us in your love, drench us in your wisdom and your discernment. May we be deeply connected to you 
as we understand what we need to let go of, what needs to be cut back, so new and abundant life to the church and in our lives can flourish once again. We humbly pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, and it's great to have you joining us uh, online today from wherever you are, Uh, hopefully in a nice comfy chair in the lounge room or somewhere where there's a little bit of sun perhaps streaming through the window uh, as we share together, just in joy and in worship today. Some announcements for you. Uh, The Red Shield Appeal continues. Uh, There's been much learning this year doing the digital door knock uh, as has been undertaken there. Uh, So some challenges there uh, that we've been picking up on. But also, once again, great blessing uh, that has come to us with uh, the collections that have been taken, or the fundraising that's been done through this month, and also those that have been occurring throughout the year. Well, now over 80% of the way towards our target, but there is that 20% to go, and in faith believing, would really like uh, to hit that target there, uh, just so the work that we do in the community uh, just can continue to expand and extend, and we can see God's work and what we do there. So continue to spread the word for these last few weeks and let's see if we can chase down the last remaining 20% there and hit that target. What a blessing that would be to our work here. And as part of that too, uh, don't forget there is the initiative at the moment where you can watch the movie The Same Kind of Different as Me. It's a fundraiser for the Red Shield that's being done through the Salvation Army. So if you go to salvationarmy.org.au and you'll find the information somewhere there on the website, Uh, I think the tickets are $12 each, and then you can stream that. You have two days from the time you purchase the tickets to stream that at your leisure uh, in the comfort of your own home there. And I've watched a couple of trailers, and I believe this can be a a very impactful film and probably a message that's also very relevant uh, to what we see happening around the world today, that, you know, in God's eyes, we are all equal, aren't we? Uh, So we may be different, but that same kind of different as me in God's eyes. He loves us all equally. We'll continue in the worship as we listen to the music and consider our giving back to God and the giving of our tithes and offerings from wherever we are and however we do that today. If you um, need to give electronically, that is possible to do so. But we'll be blessed by Jan as she shares with us. Thank you. The church is the building we go to when we want to learn about God. Nope, this is a church. Those are people. Yep, in fact, it's you and me. You kind of lost me. The church isn't a building. The church is the people who have made Jesus the leader of their lives. And that's us. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we exist for the world. Oh, okay. 
I still don't get it. Let's look in the book of Acts. That's where the Bible talks about the very first church, the people who first believed in Jesus. They didn't have buildings to meet in, so they met where they could, usually in people's homes. So their church was a house? Nope, the church met in houses. Even then, the church was the people. And the apostles taught them many things about God. They did great and wonderful things with God's power. God did amazing things through everyone in the church. Through all the people? How? The people of early church put others first. They prayed together, they shared meals, they shared their time, they shared everything. Everything? Really? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. The Bible tells us that when one of them needed something, others shared what they had. They even sold things and used the money to help out. That's amazing. That's putting others first. The early church was really good at it. For instance, this one guy, Joseph, sold a field and brought the money to the people of the church to help those who needed it. Awesome! What made them do that? They all agreed. They all wanted to live like Jesus, and the apostles told them how Jesus put others first when he died on the cross and went up to heaven. The early church learned about Jesus and lived like him, so they put others first. I think I get it. Great! But you haven't heard the best part. When others saw how those first church people lived, it made them want to follow Jesus too. In fact, more people decided to follow Jesus every single day. Wow, God did do amazing things through the first church people. And God still does amazing things through his people when they live like Jesus and put others first. Right, because we are the church. And we exist for the world. The church is the building we go to when we want to learn about God. Nope. Well, restrictions are starting to lift. We received an early mark for that on Friday, just gone, didn't we? And many people are now enjoying the opportunity to get away for the weekend. So there's much in life that we value and that we enjoy and that we're looking forward to returning to as COVID-19 restrictions are eased. But if we focus upon the church in that, and we spoke about this last week, should it be looking forward to returning things to only what they were like a few months ago? Or does the church now have a greater opportunity ahead of us? An opportunity to press in closely to God, to seek his voice and direction, and understand where he desires to lead us in restoring his church to be the people of God that he always intended us to be. Well, today we want to explore that a little bit further. We're going to take a look at the early church immediately following the day of Pentecost, which we see described in Acts 2, 42 to 47. And we're seeking to continue a conversation around the principles that we see there of being the church and how they can be woven into what we each have been hearing and have been prompted with in these days. So as we learn again from the example of church as it originally formed, what emerging opportunities are there that we should grasp hold of. I have some friends who are joining me today to help in that conversation, and I know many of you would know them well, but just in case not, we have Major Kevin Lum, our Area Officer for the North and Northwest of Tasmania. We have Anita Reeve, who is our Social Operations Manager uh, for North and Northwest Tasmania, and we have Kelly Brown, uh, the Ministry Assistant and Community Engagement Lead at the Launceston Corps. So let me read that scripture to you to get us started. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. And the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. So we see this early church community who were on fire with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They were bonded together through their common faith in Jesus Christ, their unselfish love for one another and their determination to proclaim the gospel. And if we look at that first verse, Acts 2.42, we should note from the outset that all the members of this early Christian community were devoted in their practices. So what does that mean? 
Well, it's telling us they're exerting great effort and persisting in doing the things that are mentioned. They were persevering in them, steadfastly continuing, not being swayed in a different direction by any difficulty that came their way. These actions had already become continuous and habitual, characteristics which define the essence of who they were as the people of God. And if we take a look, deeper look, I'd like to start with the second characteristic devotion mentioned. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Now the word for fellowship is kononia in the Greek and that refers to intimate community spirit. We're not talking about casual acquaintances here. Christian fellowship includes a relationship with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But we mustn't forget the and. So Christian fellowship is a relationship with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and a meaningful, intentional, horizontal relationship with other believers. The early believers were a distinct and identifiable group characterised by their deep partnership. And then we have two distinct activities mentioned. The breaking of bread, celebrating communion with our risen Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, partaking of the Lord's Supper and sharing communion one with each other in fellowship over a common meal, and prayer. The word is plural here in the original language, so it's suggesting devotion to corporate prayer. Salvation Army has been active throughout this time in calling the people of God together in prayer, and we have our current National 21-Day Pray It Forward initiative in which we've been invited to participate. So Kevin, I'd like to throw to you first of all, What has God been revealing afresh over these past months about the importance of God's people being devoted to prayer, not just individually, but also in praying together? I think that the word devoted in particular uh, is of particular importance to me to be able to answer your question. Devoted brings the concepts of delight and commitment together. Devoted and delight speak of something that we want to do not just something that we uh, might just be obedient to or dutiful to. Devotion and delight emanate from the heart. And so prayer, individually and corporately, should be something that sets our heart ablaze. It should bring joy to us. Prayer is simply a word that describes talking to God. When we pray... It is meant to be a two-way street of conversation, of listening and of talking with God, a natural part of our relationship with him. And the privilege and (laughs) and experience of talking with God and listening to what he has to say should stir us in all sorts of ways and most certainly include stirring us with delight. Mm. Prayer that comes out of devotion and is brought with delight is how our conversations with our loving God should be. Not out of duty, not prayer in times of panic, uh, nor crisis, or just when we think we need something from God, or only on structured prayer on Sundays. Delight, it is a thing of the heart. And I think that's what we're being called back to and are learning afresh. Yeah, very good. So through this time of COVID-19, there's been the challenge for so many of dealing with isolation. Now, we've understood, obviously, the restrictions that need to be put in place to protect life. But isolation can and it does bring very significant impacts upon the well-being of people and upon their mental health. So that characteristic of devotion to fellowship, I think it speaks to that reality as God's people. He doesn't want us to be isolated from each other. So Anita, you might like to share on some of the work that you've been involved with during this time. Uh, That's in terms of practical assistance that we've been given to people in isolating circumstances. But we've also been chatting around the importance of being, making meaningful connections with people and especially for faith communities to do that and also of some new challenges uh, that might be ahead uh, out of this time. Um, yes, it, ha- it has been a challenging time, particularly where, um, where 
we're looking to deliver the services that we have been um, providing. So we've had to be quite innovative and, and different in the way that we do that. Um, and the government also funded us to uh, provide um, food hampers to those that are in isolation who had to go into quarantine for various reasons. Um, and look, it was, I think it was a unique opportunity because it was people that we don't normally provide service to in lots of circumstances. So it was a real privilege to be able to give them that opportunity just to connect into community. So in the early days, it was very challenging. Um, we weren't able to source food any more than anybody else in the community. So we had to... Um, we were restricted to buying two items um, per customer as well. And when we were looking to provide, you know, up to 75 hampers to people, perhaps in a two-day turnaround, that became quite difficult and quite st stressful. Um, but we were also innovative in that and people came together in the Salvation Army to do that. So we had core officers... Um, uh, from Kings Meadows and Launceston and we had volunteers and we had employees and all just pulling together to um, get that out to the people in our community. So although it was difficult, it was also um, a privilege, a real privilege. And some of the feedback w that we received, um, it's just been wonderful, really. And we've heard from people that just... Um, said they didn't know what they would do, what they would have done um, without um, us coming in and just providing that food. And, and in lots of circumstances, it was uh, medical support as well. So providing prescriptions and over-the-counter medications and things like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think for faith-based faith um, communities that provide these sorts of services. We are important because we're a point of connection. We have been a point of connection between COVID-19 and, and the broader society. And um, we are key to successful preparation for and response to that outbreak. I think um, it, it's the government finds it much more difficult to respond so rapidly um, as what not-for-profits and faith-based communities can. Um, so we've been vital, I think, in that um, process. And, you know, we've adapted and we've changed and risen to the challenge of supporting our community in different ways quickly and with care. And I think that's because we're driven... Well, it's not think. I know it's because we're driven by um, the love of God and sharing that care to others. Um, so it's been a fantastic opportunity um, just to do that. And look, there were times I, I can remember I was out in the burrows and uh, I just said, Lord, we can't do this. I said, it's impossible. I just threw my arms in the air. I said, I just don't know how we're going to do this. And, and you know, he said, you don't have to do it. Call on me and call on others and do it together. And that's exactly what we did. And it's just been inspiring to see the team work together so well. Thank you. So the other characteristic devotion we have spoken of in Acts 2.42 is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. An apostle is someone who was sent or commissioned as a messenger. And the message an apostle brings is one that is focused back on the authority of the sender. So by that I mean really just an apostle is one sent out by Jesus Christ himself to preach the gospel. So there's no doubt that this teaching would have been central and it would have been centred on the life and teaching of Jesus Christ and the redemptive aspects of his life, death and resurrection. I'm going to throw it to Kevin again. Now, Kevin doesn't know the other two said all the hard questions had to go to you. So, so Kevin, do you think there is a, an apathy that has developed in the Western church the importance of the gospel message we heard it so often it's become familiar to something in the background rather than at the forefront that we proclaim with excitement and joy. So what freshness of opportunity, if I put it that way, have the recent circumstances revealed about the importance of being a messenger devoted to gospel teaching? Thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I 
think it is, that it's reasonable to suggest that it is somewhat easy in our Western setting of relative comfort and abundance to drift into complacency about the importance of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel message. That drift, I think, is compounded in these times of the postmodern world that we're in today, the postmodern society, of the growing secular world that no longer uh, appears to be receptive to hearing about God, or at least not to how we have tried to communicate the gospel. But I think that is changing, or at least the opportunity to change is upon us right now. One of the things I hear people saying, and, and this is true for me as well, is that they're surprised. Through these <laughs> coronavirus days of seeing and speaking with neighbours, that is now happening in ways that hasn't happened in the past. Mm. It's like it's become a forgotten art or way of, of being. Neighbours, yes, but have been strangers but now no longer strangers, is something that is happening. In being forced to remain at home, it has caused us to recalibrate our values. We have been so occupied with being busy, with work, yeah. school, shopping, <laughs> daily routines, daily commutes, <laughs> that relationships have played second fiddle for such a long time, and they shouldn't have. Well, I think there has been this, this rediscovery taking place. It's in the stories that I've been hearing. It's in the media. This rediscovery of the importance and value of being connected in healthy relationships. People who have been calling family, FaceTiming, Zooming, checking in over the phone with mates they haven't called for a long time maybe or spoken to in years. And they have begun to look out again for their neighbours. So I think, I, I think we have a reawakening to the value and importance of relationships. Mm. So I think the freshness of opportunity that you're asking me about, Roderick, yeah. to share the gospel will be found through relationships. Yeah. As we learn to be present to our, our neighbours again, forge meaningful connections back out into the community that, are, that is around us, the ways to be and to share the message of the gospel will be found afresh. Mm. Hallelujah. Acts 2, 43, we read, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, amongst the early believers, there was a deep reverence and respect given to the evidence that God was at work within the church. Miraculous wonders were occurring, extraordinary events having a supernatural effect upon all who were witnessing them. And signs, signs that were given for the purpose of confirming or authenticating the gospel message of our Lord Jesus and his eternal purposes. So the apostles were performing wonders and signs that no person in their own strength could replicate or take credit for. It had to be of God. And thus they were a powerful confirmation of the gospel message that was spoken of through members of the body of Christ. Last week I spoke of the church in the West being in decline and it's hard to dispute that. But I also think a preoccupation with the deficit or the negative can cloud our vision that God is always actively at work. Perhaps we haven't lost our conviction of that truth, but maybe as the church we had lost a bit of our sense of awe for that. So could God be using this time and the circumstances of COVID-19 for his church to recapture a sense of awe for his wonders and signs? So Kelly, I've been waiting patiently over here. I'm going to ask you first, um, but all are invited to answer, if you wish. Throughout these past few months, where have you seen God at work, seen those signs of evidence uh, that confirm the message of the gospel? So I think for me, uh, I've just seen people stepping up. As Anita said, people coming together to help. Um, and one of the great examples for that here, for us, is the partnership with YFM that has built from 
one breakfast once a month to three breakfasts three times a week and dinner on a Wednesday. Um, and that has also been a partnership with our street teams. Obviously, they've not been able to go out with all pubs and clubs uh, closed. Uh, so they have been uh, sh polishing up their barista skills, making the coffees for those who have been coming in. But I've uh, taken over the Wednesday dinner because breakfast is just too early for me to get up for. Um, but it's just been a great opportunity to just get to know these people. So we have contact with these people, some of them now, four times a week. So every, every, each of the three days for breakfast and the dinner on a Wednesday. And um, it's just such a great opportunity to get to know them, even though we're just serving them through the cafe door. Um, you can still have a little chat to them through there and see how they're going. So um, I've found much blessing uh, in, in doing that and uh, just been privileged to work alongside the WayFM team. They are amazing. Um, and also our street teams as well. And the other thing that I've noted is that people have approached us. We've had three people just this week approach us about volunteering with us. So I think that speaks volumes about um, our profile in the community uh, and people seeing that the work we do and that they just really want to come alongside and be a part of that with us. Um, yes, I, I too, I think, you know, everyone that has worked together and responded to the need, and that's been amazing. And we've also seen um, CORE go online, and in doing so, I think that's opened up, you know, a great opportunity for people in our community to join with us um, right around the globe, which is mind-blowing, really, isn't it, um, in worshipping. And definitely God has been at work through his people in that as well. We can join with Salvationists in Sweden, in England, Africa, in other parts of Australia, all across the globe. And we have become more connected, I think, as an army. Um, and God has been at work online, yeah. which has come through his people, um, which has been amazing. And we have heard of people making recommitments and of people who have never sat in church join us online. You know, I think initially many core officers probably thought um, we, we were probably ahead of the ball game here, fortunately, but how am I going to reach my congregation? I, I don't know even or have the equipment that I need to do that with. So, um, but people have shown initiative throughout the world in, in Salvation Army Corps and have been worshipping together. And I think that's just amazing, really. Um, who would have thought that a, a global pandemic could, um, you know, where people have been asked to isolate, could be actually used by God to connect us more than ever um, within our global community. So, I, you know, God is at work in that, mm -hmm. I feel. God's certainly working that. I'm slowly getting used to watching myself back to see how I might be able to improve over the live stream. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> she used to freak me out. Kevin, you got anything to add? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to affirm that God is a creator God and the DNA to create is within us as well. We have creativity and that's really come to the fore in, uh, in these days, innovation, adaptation, being people being very, very creative, and that includes the church, and seeing the church adapt to how it can still be connected to the faith community, how we can each be connected and supporting each other, doing that in virtual ways, in online ways, um, and in ways of doing drop-offs to people's homes. There's all sorts of uh, creative and innovative approaches that have been taken and that has flowed out from not just the church trying to look after itself but how the church can be connected and meaningful back out into the community mm -hmm. and Anita's given some beautiful story ar ar around that this this morning uh, at a personal level um, I, I see things uh, happening all by itself uh, the church isn't waiting for the senior pastor or the core officer in our in our case um, mm -hmm for them to give instructions to us about how to be. Stuff is happening all by itself, and I find that exciting. Absolutely. I find the Holy Spirit at work in that. And uh, example for, for myself is that 
almost at the beginning of the coronavirus and us having to stay at home more and then into lockdown, uh, I got invited into a prayer group. And that prayer group got uh, set up as a Zoom prayer group. And it has been a sensational time. It wasn't in existence before, though. Those, that group of people have now come together and we meet every week in a virtual setting and the prayer started out for an hour meeting and then it's gone to an hour and a quarter, hour and a half. Last week we were nudging two hours and we still could have gone on. Uh, it's like there's a fresh fire that's taking place in this prayer. God is breathing life back into his church, I believe. Also in this description of the early church immediately following Pentecost, we see that it was defined by deep spiritual unity. Verses 44, 45, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So there was a great unity in the fervour of their spiritual passion and also unity in mind and purpose amongst the first believers. And one of the main ways we see this spiritual unity manifested is in voluntary, compassionate sharing. It wasn't a forced redistribution of wealth. It was a freely given action that was responding simply to people's needs. So the early believers, they sold property, they sold possessions and shared the proceeds to help those in need. And when we read that phrase, don't just think of um, destitution or a severe lack of basic needs. The phrase also has a bit of a business connotation. So you could say the proceeds were being used to help people in their business or simply help them in what they were striving to do and to achieve. So the freely given redistribution was helping to build healthy community. I've often wondered what this might look like in the church today, the free sharing of resources to help anyone in need. We certainly see it in part. We have many generous people. We do a lot. We've already heard of that to help people in need. But I don't think we've still reached today what fully represents these early believers, these believers of the first church, and that was a hallmark of their spiritual unity. So Kelly, something we've seen spring up here in Launceston during the past few months of COVID-19's a greater desire for local communities to be pooling their resources more freely to help build the capacity of their local community. So share on that. So popping up on Facebook over the last few months have been some little community co-ops that have been set up. So in particular, I'm thinking of the suburbs of Waverley, Summerhill and Youngtown. So um, community-minded individuals who are looking to intentionally connect and support their neighbours have set up a simple swap, swap stand on their nature strip to become a place of community. It's a place of pooling resources and sharing together during that tough time of COVID-19, not just grocery items and food, but to share ideas, to provide activities and spaces to meet, to get to know each other and build a greater sense of belonging across their communities and a great, they have a great sense of being able to provide for their community longer term, so more sustain, sustainably. For one example that we've heard of is adopt a fruit tree. Uh, which is a, a really cool idea, I think. So you put, a, put it in your garden if uh, you own your home or if you rent, you can put it in a pot um, so the fruit can be shared among the neighbourhood when the trees grow and the fruit comes. And they're also looking to build a stronger community both across their own neighbourhood and area but I think generally across the greater Launceston area as well is what I see. So I see here, what I see here captures a bit of a sense of what the early church was like in supporting each other and helping others in need. Mm. Oh, they're quite exciting, aren't they? It's good to be out in community. If, um, any, anything to, you'd like to add on that point, Kevin or Anita? Or, yeah. I think Kelly is intuitively on the, to the right thing, this, um, especially with the Waverley Co-op, that sense of being out there in the community, just being present, and, um, and being the person of God in, in that area. You know, in a, in a society where it is for most people easy to become self-sufficient in, in, in our settings, our lives can be sustained and maintained without interaction with our neighbours. Uh, the sense of village 
gets lost or has been lost somewhere in that journey. The sense and value of being there for each other, uh, doing life together, helping each other out is lost or can be lost and we li end up living our lives in, in relative isolation of each other. And so it can be or is with church as well. You know, we have to learn again the value of building each other up in our capacities, uh, you know, sharing our resources, our knowledge and experience of and with God. That's the great value, I think, that church has in, in, in home groups and, and life groups and holistic small groups. Now, we have them here, um, but we aren't here a people of God built upon those things. We have them, and up to this point in time, um, they have been an add-on rather than a foundational building block for us. So I think there is a, a relearning from the Acts 2 church for us to recapture you know, the significance of uh, sharing in the ways the Acts 2 story tells mm -hmm. of resources and of spiritual unity uh, in, in, in of being the body of Christ. Um, and I find it exciting mm, that that opportunity so, is yeah. right here and now for us. Yeah. I probably just want to add to when we talk about the spiritual unity um, in the body of Christ that we, as a, uh, a church body, um, a universal church, I guess, um, we need to be really careful that there's no division amongst even, you know, denominations um, because I think that can muddy the path for people that are non-believers. So um, I think during this time, I, th I think it's been a reminder for us to be unified in the message of Christ, not just in the sharing of our resources but in the message that we um, communicate Mm. as a body of Christ. Yeah. Um, regardless of how we interpret the scriptures, I think that one clear message needs to be out there. Yeah. Now, we've seen quite a number of versions of the blessing song, haven't we, with the churches from across a nation. There's been many nations that do that in many places, just coming together in that unity yeah, for that blessing that we are to bring as God's yes. people. So Acts 2.46, Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. So we know that the church isn't constrained to a place. It's not limited to a building. Uh, we've known that. Filled by the Holy Spirit as God's people, we are the sent temple, the sent household, the sent oikos of the living God. The physical meeting places still help enable the coming together of God's people in unity. And right from the outset here, we see that the church met in those more central and formal places of worship. They were daily in the temple but they were also meeting in their homes, the more intimate, informal settings of people's households. So Anita, do you think we've lost a little bit of sight in recent years of the importance of the latter? Have we become more focused on meeting in these central places to the exclusion of meeting in our homes? And are there opportunities to be sharing communion in those home-based settings and more intimate settings once again? Yeah. Um, look, for, for our small group, we meet on a Monday and for many that come, or for some that come along to that, that is their time for church, for gathering together and um, I, you can't really underestimate the need for us to be meeting together in our homes and to be connected in this way. Um, it doesn't devalue what we do on a Sunday here worshipping together but um, certainly, as, as we talk about the early church, that is how they met. They met in their homes and in, in, you know, in the marketplaces and in their community. Um, so with COVID-19, uh, we weren't even able to do that. We weren't even able to meet in our homes. And I was so conscious that um, it was more important to do that, even more so, even though we were restricted. So we did, as I say, looked at uh, innovative ways to do that and we trialled using Zoom. Now, that didn't suit everybody because technology is not everybody's cup of tea. 
so that's that's understandable. But um, it went a long way in meeting that, providing that opportunity just for the group to meet together and to share and, and to connect and to pray. Um, we have a number of people, we pray for many people, but a number of people we're praying particularly for. And it was just a great opportunity to continue that, like Kevin was saying, um, online and to share uh, those prayers together around um, uh, people that we just have on our hearts. Um, and we, were re we did actually uh, undertook a study on um, the anxiety of the COVID-19 um, impact. And it was just a four-week study, but it really reminded us to live a faith, a, a life of faith not of fear. There was so much fear we could see in our community and even within ourselves um, of the unknown and, and what our future might look like. Um, but it was just a really good way to connect. And, um, yeah, uh, I think for future, um, you know, we need to continue to discover those new ways of um, connecting. And, and particularly, I think... The challenge for us is to face out into the community, um, be in the community and understand our community um, and what those needs are. Um, so although, you know, I think it's so important to meet together in our homes, um, we also need to be outward facing and, and try and understand how we can also be in that community um, in new and different ways. And I think this whole pandemic has just taught us to rethink around some of those things. Thank you. So now we'll look at the attitude of the hearts of the early believers, and Kevin sort of already started to draw us into this in his first answer when talking about prayer. But verse 46, once again, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. Now, it seems apparent that the attitude of the early believers was another great distinguishing and defining characteristic of who they were as God's people. As they met continually at the temple, as they met in each other's homes, breaking bread and sharing that deep and meaningful relationship, there was gladness, there was sincerity in their hearts. And the word gladness here is actually speaking of wild joy, ecstatic delight. You know, there was exuberance, there was exhilaration from the ever-present joy of the presence of God that was now with them. There was no miserable Christians in the early church, it seems. And sincerity, that implies simplicity. Their hearts for God and for each other were uncomplicated and unencumbered from any other burden or distraction. And the result of living like this was that the early Christian community enjoyed the favour and the goodwill of all the people. Now, we could say that's all well and good, the early church you read of in Acts 2 wasn't yet threatened by persecution, wasn't yet disrupted by internal problems. Unfortunately, that was soon to come. But, Kevin, this prophetic word that the Spirit has spoken to you, be the people of God that you are always intended to be, not necessarily as you have become, build my kingdom. Do we see here just a part of what God maybe wishing to reveal to us, have we lost the wild and exuberant joy from our fellowship and spiritual unity and encumbered ourselves with things that have pushed us away and drift, made us drift off course from where God would want us to be? I think that um, in being caught, uh, not being able to come to and meet face-to-face -face in a church as a faith community and find ourselves... Uh, caught away from that and in our homes uh, alone and then questioning uh, what, does, what does this mean for me as a person of God, as a son or daughter of God? What is, how am I meant to pursue my relationship? How am I meant to... All of these things arise for us and, and I think this is part of how God has been stirring uh, his people uh, and we find ourselves, many I've heard, and it's the same for me, uh, praying more mm -hmm. in our homes, 
no longer relied on church to be providing something for us, but this personal seeking that starts to take place um, in our homes and in our, in our private walk. So I really don't have the answers to all of this. And if I and others did, uh, then the kingdom in our Western world setting would be, uh, be growing and flourishing and not in the general decline uh, that it has been in for such a long time now. Mm. But I am convinced, I'm convinced that God is calling us to individually and collectively discover the way forward through seeking him. You know, I was talking before about uh, its relationships mm. that we are learning to value again as maybe the highest priorities. And the highest priorities in our relationships uh, should be our relationship with, with God. And that as we seek God, as we pursue God, try and press in, not just to understand him, but to be deeper in our relationship with him. As we do this as individuals and then collectively encourage each other on in this quest of life to seek God, to know God, and most importantly, to love God. Mm. I think answers will come out of that um, as we <laughs> learn again to walk alone with God and learn again to collectively walk with God in being the people of God, the church. But it begins as a very personal journey for us. It always has been, but I think we've, we've got distracted or lost somewhere in amongst that, that complacency that I was speaking about. And so I think... Uh, you know, this abundant life, this flourishing that we are meant to have, this countenance of God, because we've been so close in his presence that is upon us, the inner, holo, the inner working of the Holy Spirit that transforms us and transforms us to be more like Jesus. As we become more Christ-like, that countenance glows from the inside out, I think. And so in this journey of seeking God and in loving God more and more and more, to not be satisfied with the relationship as it is, that there is something in that quest that will continue to transform us individually and collectively as his people, that becomes so attractive that a world that currently may look upon the church and not see relevance for it or reason to get connected to it or the people, but they would yearn to say, I need some of that abundance. Where's the source of that and that flourishing? Mm. I think that's somewhere to recapture that yeah. in being the people of God as God intends us to be not necessarily as we become. Yeah. And then we will build a God, the kingdom. We're trying to build it now. But I think in, in loving God and pursuing holiness, this quest, that some of those answers come. Mm. Very exciting times ahead, I think we all believe. Yeah. So the footnote, and a very important one, on this description of the early church community was that the Lord added daily to their number to their fellowship, those who are being saved. Here in Australia, in our city, and our local churches, the harvest no longer seems to be to that proportion. Sometimes we might struggle to see someone saved monthly or perhaps even yearly, let alone daily. Yet Jesus said, I will build my church. Nothing will overcome it. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. So for all the reasons we could put forward for why the harvest is difficult in these times, seems logical to me that if these characteristics we see evidenced in the early church are again captured and lived out with authenticity and that united spiritual passion, there's no reason why the Lord will not add daily to our number those who are being saved. So just as we close, I'd invite anyone to share any final thoughts on that or any final things that you might like to share with us. Yeah. I'll 
So I absolutely agree with your comments and your thinking, uh, Roderick. You know, if we capture again uh, the essence of being the people of God and building the kingdom of God as it was in the early church, then there is, I think, absolutely no reason uh, why the Lord will not add to our fellowship uh, those who are being saved. Mm. Amen. I think for me too, uh, it is what I, I sort of shared earlier, the unity of the church body must model the unity of the gospel. Um, so we need to be unified in our message and in our purpose and turn our faces outwards. I think uh, General Peddle eloquently sort of expressed that um, recently. We need to face what that need is out in the community, but do it in a unified um, way so that we're not fighting one another. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. You, you, you're not authentic if um, your message is not unified. So. Mm. Anything you'd like to add? Well, thank you, Kevin, Anita and Kelly, for joining us today in this conversation. As has been the focus of the first week of our national 21 days of prayer, we pray each of us will be deeply connected in relationship with God as we seek his wisdom, his insight and his discernment and how to move forward. And we need to keep this conversation going. You know, there's been the four of us here to share today. But for anyone who's been listening, if there are things you've been voicing from your heart as we've spoken insight and vision that the Holy Spirit's been sharing with you, would love to hear. Call, text, email, Facebook message, post us a letter. You know, it's the devotion and spiritual unity of us all in fellowship, in wisdom, in exuberant joy that will bring insight into what we share together in Jesus Christ for a time such as this. And we'll see us recapture all that we need to be as the people of God for these days. Let me share in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we just are, are so grateful and are so humbled that you continue to speak to us. You continue to lead us and you continue to guide, to us, uh, guide us. And we thank you for all the experiences that we are going through at these times. They haven't been welcomed, I suppose, if you put it that way. We wouldn't have wished this to come upon us, and especially the, the tragic consequences for those of so many who have lost their life. But we know you are speaking to us through it all. And we know that there is an important message for us to grasp. So in doing that, may we be inspired by your word, such as what we've read today of your early church and spoken about. And may we be inspired by that daily conversation in prayer with you. The two together, just inspiring us and changing the attitude of our hearts to be totally sold out and devoted to you. May we be people who just seek to spread your love in all that we do, your living hope and joy. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. As we've read in the scriptures and we've heard this morning, it's the Holy Spirit working in us that will make the difference in this world. And we're going to sing a prayer, and I invite you to sing it and to pray it, that the Holy Spirit will move in each one of us. The Holy Spirit will burn in each one of us and that it will saturate each one of us. Holy Spirit, move in me. Search my heart, reveal to that is unclean Holy Spirit move in me Come Oh come Saturate me
have access to the Holy Spirit every day of the week, every hour, every minute. We just have to ask and allow and accept. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. A benediction. Go into the world showing a gentle attitude toward everyone. Be joyful and thankful. 
Fill your mind with those things that are good and deserve praise. Things true, noble, right, pure, lovely and honourable. Put into practice what you have heard here. And may the God who gives peace be with each of you. We go in the peace of Christ to love and to serve all creation. Let's sing a final song and acknowledge that God is an awesome God. God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. 